And I think that it's very easy for us as coaches and society, I guess, to see sports parents as the real enemy. And we tend to focus on the worst case scenarios. You know, I think back in my 20 years in teaching and or coaching and you you, you think about somebody mentions parents to you and you immediately think of the absolute shockers that you had, the ones that sent you the worst emails, the ones that were always wanting to talk about little Johnny, the ones who you felt didn't really have a clue what they were talking about, but felt the need to, to tell you everything that, that they knew. But actually what you then neglect is the many hundreds who were absolutely brilliant and at no point caused any problem. And actually, who wanted to support you and do, you know, what was best for their, for their child? Welcome to the Coaches Club Podcast, powered by Transform Sport where we believe great coaches transform lives, athletes deserve great coaches, and coaches deserve great training. I'm your host, Luke Gromer, and every week we're bringing you conversations with coaches and leaders in sport that will help you grow as an effective teacher and transformational leader so that you and your team can reach your potential. Coaches, I'm excited to welcome Gordon McClellan to the Coaches Club podcast. Gordon is the founder and CEO of Working With Parents in Sport, which he founded after 20 years as a teacher and coach to all age levels, from seven-year-olds to adults. He's the author of three books, Two Hats, a book for parent coaches who are coaching or thinking of coaching their own children, Great Sports Parenting, a pocket guide for parents of children in sport, and Engage, a coach's guide to building positive relationships with parents. He is a parent of two children, and the early sporting experiences of his own children prompted him to set up the company as well as to write the three books I just mentioned. Gordon works with organizations, coaches, and parents to improve the sporting experience for athletes at all levels. Today, we talk about the coach-parent relationship and how it can be improved. Two quick things before we hop in. First, if you'd like to get a free PDF of the notes from this episode, go to transformsport.org slash podnotes or click the link in the show details to get a free copy of the notes from today's episode. And second, in July, I'm launching the Coaches Club course and community. Too many coaches feel frustrated, isolated, and unsupported in their coaching. The Coaches Club course and community is an eight-week online cohort course that will help you grow as an effective teacher and transformational leader surrounded by other like-minded coaches from across sports. The course consists of eight weekly masterclasses covering specific coaching topics, four one-on-one calls with me, and a lot more. Spots are filling up and only a few are left. The cohort will begin the week of July 15th, so claim your spot before they're gone. To learn more about the Coaches Club, go to transformsport.org slash coachesclub or click the link in the show details or just send me an email with questions. You can email me at luke at transformsport.org. And if you'd like to reserve your spot in the cohort, go to transformsport.org slash free call or click the link in the show details to schedule a call to talk with me or send me an email to set something up. Now to my conversation with Gordon McClellan of Working With Parents in Sports. Enjoy the episode. All right, coaches, really excited to welcome Gordon McClellan to the Coaches Club podcast today. Uh, Gordon, let's just, let's start here. Um, you uh, founded and are the CEO of Working With Parents in Sports. And so let's just start and talk about uh, the most common issues that surface in the coach parent relationship and maybe some practical things that coaches can do to prevent or resolve those issues. Yeah. I mean, I think we've got to sort of unpeel, you know, the whole thing, the, this whole relationship between um, coaches and sports parents. I mean, I think over the years, um, in lots of cases, I think it's gradually uh, got worse, that relationship, you know, as sports maybe become a little bit more professionalised, I guess, or has been driven more towards those uh, younger ages than it maybe was uh, in the past. Um, and I think that it's very easy for us as coaches and society, I guess, to see sports parents as the real enemy. And we tend to focus on the worst case 
scenarios. You know, I think back of my 20 years in teaching and or coaching and you 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 think about somebody mentions parents to you and you immediately think of the absolute shockers that you had the ones that sent you the worst emails the ones that were always wanting to talk about little johnny the ones who you felt didn't really have a clue what they were talking about but felt the need to to tell you everything that that they knew but actually what you then neglect is the many hundreds who were absolutely brilliant and at no point caused any problem. And actually, who wanted to support you and do, you know, what was best for their for their child? So I think that that whole perception of where we see parents is important as a bit of a starting point. And I think we've only got to look at this work around the world and people beginning to recognise the important role um, that parents play. Is I, th- I don't think over the next 20 years with with where we are in sport and society, looking at some of the scandals that have come out of English football, some of the scandals that have come out of US gymnastics, where it's going to be acceptable that coaches and athletes go through one door and parents go through another, and there's a great big wall put in between them. I think there's going to have to be a far greater transparency. Um, But with that comes... uh, I guess, a far greater understanding of coaches in terms of what they're going to have to give to parents. And likewise, you know, this shouldn't be a, a one-way street either from, from coaches feeling that they have to budge everything that they've ever done because actually parents need to shift their perspectives and some of their approach as well. And, you know, our work's very much been centred on, on, I guess, bridging those, those gaps between, between the two parties and, and, and not just them. You know, we, what we're missing in all this already talking is the organisational piece, because actually, if we want everybody to work effectively in the best interest of young people, which I'm sure the vast majority of us do, you know, we need to align what club cultures are and philosophies are. And the coaches are merely the gatekeepers of those cultures. And only then can we actually give information to parents or have expectations about their approach and how they behave around the sporting experience if we've got our house in order first. So, you know, everybody's got a part to play in, in I, I guess, working more effectively together. Yeah, that's really good. And, and I appreciate the way you, yeah, talked about all the parties involved. It definitely has to be a, a collaborative effort between all of them. Um, to maybe hone in a little bit on on coaches and what are some ways you mentioned increasing transparency what are some ways that coaches can increase transparency with the parents of their athletes yeah look I think I think there's some very quick wins I mean we've got to really think about how we're communicating you know the the world is based around communication you know what is it that we are selling as a product you know what is it that we're we're trying to achieve with the kids what program are are, are parents buying into what are they expecting to see and we need to be able to you know communicate that effectively so that people know what they're going to see when they arrive at training when they arrive at matches um there's so many times in sport where those messages can be mixed and can be lost in translation. So that clear communication of programs is important to start with. But then just the things like, you know, running your, your, your annual parents meeting, actually getting them in. But you look, the skill here is people have talked about parents meetings for years. But the reality is that with lots of these, it's no good if the parents come in and the coaches stand at the front and just tell them, this is going to be a great season. This is how it's going to be. And you have to listen to the coach for half an hour. It's got to be far more thought out than that in terms of, you know, how are we working together here, giving parents a voice in that process as well. So you've got that collaboration going on. Um, so, you know, the parents meetings, a good one. I think we're good at the beginning of your parents meeting. I think people run them. I mean, how effective they are, I'm not sure. It's a bit like the code of conduct for me. I, I, I totally value the fact we need codes of conduct. Um, but I also feel that people sign it. And in lots of cases, three weeks later, people are doing what they said they weren't going to do and nobody pleases it. So it renders itself ineffective rather than the culture being a, a much bigger culture that has everybody on board 
um, and working together. But I think that ongoing communication is important as well. You know, what are we communicating on a, a weekly basis, on a monthly basis? Are we trying to enhance the parents' experience around the sport by sharing content with them, perhaps from other sources? Obviously, we've got to be very clear uh, with our logistics and our timings and, you know, being aware that parents struggle with managing schedules and calendars. You know, can we be understanding of the commitments that parents have got? So keeping those last minute changes to uh, a minimum. And, and then the medium, I guess, of how we communicate. You know, when is it right to use Twitter and Facebook? When is it right to run through apps where we're communicating just with our group, WhatsApp groups? You know, what, we've got to really think about what we're trying to do with with each of those different different mediums. And I guess the big one for me, I, I always think that if coaches have to have a crucial conversation with a parent. So something that's potentially negative or going to have a negative impact on the kid. Um, I think we should be trying to do those face to face. Um, I think we know that, you know, when you send text messages or you send emails, they can just be totally misinterpreted by people, can't they? And I think that, you know, if you think back to what I've just said in the last few minutes, I guess, there's quite a lot to unravel there. You know, there's a sort of type of information. How am I going to do it? What, how am I going to frame some of these different bits? How am I going to run my parents' meeting? You know, and, and then even our behaviours, you know, as as coaches. You know, if, if we're saying we're about developing kids, then we need to be seen in our behaviours that we're, we're celebrating some of those character traits like determination, resilience, and good communication and creativity. It's no good as saying things like this if then all we ever talk about is whether we won or lost, for example, or all we ever celebrate is the top scorer because we're immediately telling parents that, no, that's what we truly value here. So getting them to buy into that is 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 challenging. So that, as you can see there, there's a, there's a lot to unravel. You've clearly got to be very clear on what you're trying to communicate, but communication is the key. Yeah, that's really good. And like you said, there is a there's a lot there and it's it's complex. I, I want to circle back a little bit to what you mentioned, the preseason parent meeting. Really common practice. I think most coaches would say, I do this and I think it's valuable. But if you were running one, how would you craft it to, like you said, be more intentional with it so that parents feel like they are a part of the process from the moment you have that preseason meeting? Yeah, look, it's 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 not easy for coaches. I mean, look, I I have the benefit of twenty years of being stood in front of people in the classroom and in coaching environments, and now with this role, you know, I'm speaking to thousands of parents and coaches in different sports all over the all over the world. So, uh, you know, I I get that maybe I find it easier to stand up in front and facilitate some of these things. Not straightforward, but I think some of the things we've got to think about is that. Yes, we want to articulate some of our philosophies, what we're hoping to achieve as the coach uh, and the team and the group. But I think within that, we need to be asking the parents, what are they hoping for, you know, during the course of the season? You know, can we get any information from the parents about their children, for example, as part of that? You know, we, we give out trivial pursuit cards, the, the board game, which has six questions on parents fill in the back the questions that are personal about their kid coach has 10 20 cards they immediately know which soccer teams x supports what they like doing away from the sport some of their favorite food just things that build up that kind of rapport where parents feel that they've handed over their most precious belonging in their kids to the coaches and the coaches care and want to get to know their kid a little bit more than just their child the sports person uh, I think there's some bits around it's really good if we can get to know names of parents as well and we don't just see them as somebody's mom or somebody's dad. I think that's really important. And look, in our workshops, you know, we play games. You know, we we play uh, higher and lower with big playing cards on play your cards, right? Get all the parents shouting, being competitive, having a go. And we use that, for example, to show parents that there's going to be plenty of ups and downs during the course of the season. And, and it's such a simple thing, but the parents don't feel they're being talked at. They've had a chance to have a bit of a game. They've had a chance to give some information about the kid. They've had a chance to share some of their feelings. 
we've talked about how we can bring all that together and working as a team in terms of, you know, I'm trying to do my coach role. Could you do these bits around the experience and let's, you know, work together and communicate to make sure that, you know, with these boundaries are set and we, we all understand, you know, what they may look like. So I think it's just that giving the voice, making it interactive um, not setting the room up like you're back at school. Parents really hate going back to school and, and that idea that they sit on chairs facing the front and the person stands at the front and delivers it. We can make it that little bit less formal. I just think, um, you know, welcomes people in and it's a little bit more open. Um, and, and going back to what we said about parent schedules as well, you know, we should be hosting these meetings, not at an extra time. We should be doing those when the kids are training. You know, the parents are already at the venue. They always have plenty of time to watch the kids train. Well, actually, do you know what? We're going to do something better for the kids here because we want to make the kids better and actually help support them. We're going to run our parents meeting then. So, you know, other coach coaches can take the slack and we haven't put any extra demands on parents. That's good. Yeah, really good, really practical stuff in there. And I like what you mentioned about just get some information about the kids that has nothing to do with the sport. Um, really shows parents that yeah, you're interested in them as a person, not just um, a, you know a piece in a game that you're playing as the coach. Um, you mentioned as you were talking, trying to align parents and coaches and everybody around their roles. Will you talk more about? how to do that and what are what are the healthy roles that parents play and coaches should play how can coaches um, define those roles for parents and get them to buy into it yeah i mean this is the uh, this is the tough one isn't it because coaches feel that parents overstep the mark parents feel that coaches maybe sometimes don't don't do enough um i i think that the the reality of these boundaries is coaching's coaching for me um and that's running the sessions, running the game days, running everything around the sporting experience in terms of logistics, managing the environment around a particular sporting group. So as coaches, for me, we're responsible for our role modelling. We're responsible for how we approach, you know, game day, for example, and what we're yelling from the sideline you know because let's be clear on this as well you know if we're asking parents for example not to shout multiple instructions at kids which we know isn't great because actually we need them to make their own decisions I don't think coaches can then be stood right in front of them doing exactly the same thing so I think there's a, a very clear thing about what the coaching role is but what it needs to look like in an ideal world in terms of building that environment around the sessions that we deliver and obviously we've got a role in in logistics and and making sure everybody knows what's going on and where they need to be but again i think you know the word parent is just that you know it's not an extra coach you know children have a very different um perspective of the sporting experience than the adults do the adults see it as what they watch on the tv they bring in the behaviours that they see of what we see from the world's superstars. And yet that could not be any further from the truth of what a young person's sporting experience needs to look like. Um, and I think parents, have, uh, there's a number of things that, that got to understand. And this is where, you know, in our workshops, these ideas about getting them to understand that there's going to be ups and downs, how we manage that disappointment, how we deal with car journeys to and from the venue, how we understand that making comparisons pre-puberty in particular is a complete waste of time. We may think it's healthy, but actually it does none of us any good. And in a sporting context, doesn't mean anything anyway. Um, you know, what are we actually trying to achieve as parents through this sporting experience? Because we talk to parents lots about that. If you're looking at this purely on outcomes, you're going to have a very, very um, large amount of major disappointments throughout the journey. 
And how can we actually make this far more fulfilling, far more holistic in terms of developing our kids so that whatever walk of life they choose to go into, for example, that, that they're going to thrive because we've used sport as that vehicle that, that equips them with that. And I think that's where the parent perspective has got to come in. We've, we've, we've got to find a way of, you know, winning is important. You know, I'll always say that in my workshops, so is competition. But it's never as high up on the kids' agenda as it is on the parents' agenda. And we've got to understand why our children play, and that comes through healthy dialogue, because if we understand why they play, well, we can best support them, not because that's why we think that they're playing. So I think there's an awful lot. I mean, that's why we run all those workshops because there's an awful lot to pick through. But actually, when you talk to parents away from competition, lots of them will sit there and go, yeah, yeah, I can, yeah, you can sort of see that and, and start to appreciate the other angle. I think we always try and do it around lots of other parents and lots of competition and lots of fired up people sometimes. And it, it, it's, it doesn't give us that chance to reflect or feel safe to, to share thoughts and actually think about, you know, the bigger picture at play. Yeah, it's really good. There's a lot of good stuff in there. I think it's really powerful, just like you said, to ask the parents to consider why they want their kids to play. And I think most parents, and, and I'll say from experience right now, I'm coaching an, an under 10 basketball team. And before the season started, I just sent out a Google form to the parents asking them a couple questions about their kids. And one of the questions was, you know, why do you want your son playing sports? And every single one of them, it was not about winning or losing. Every single one was about learning to be a part of a team, character development, all of those things that we know sports can be the perfect venue to develop. Um, and, and so I think just having parents consider that and then me as the coach, I, I also was very clear on like, this is how we're going to do things. And the focus here is on development of them as, as players, but also more importantly, people, and then getting clear on, again, I was like, this is my role and this is the role I would ask you to take. And here's why. Um, so far it's been a, uh, with the exception of, of one issue that, that I had to address, it's been a really positive experience. Um, I think for all of the parents and myself, it, it and I think it just takes some time and intention, like you said, to kind of align people on that and, and just to make people consider like, okay, what's really important in this process. And so kind yeah, of absolutely. to, to continue on, on kind of a thread we, we talked about, and you mentioned it, I, I think that often parents get, they get a bad rap for their behavior, right? Yelling at refs, coaching from the sidelines. But like you said, like coaches can be just as guilty of those behaviors that we know aren't good for athletes. But let's say, let's assume that the coach is willing to model and teach kind of the character they want to develop. Um, and they're committed to those behaviors that allow kids to thrive. How can coaches and organizations address issues when parents aren't buying into that? Well, I, I mean, I think it goes back to the, st the start, doesn't it, about what a particular program offers or what a particular club offers. And I think that's where that uniformity around the environment is really important. Look, we know in this country, you know, and I watch the top young footballers in this country play every Sunday, and I'm fortunate enough to watch my son play against them when they play Liverpool, Manchester City, Manchester United, whoever that may be. And the reality of our academy environments over here is that no parents yell instructions to their kids because that's the environment that's been set. That's what the expectations of the clubs are that are in the sort of category one status. That's what parents are communicated. Communicated why not to yell instructions because of, for the following reasons, that we want children, you know, to make their own decisions. We want children to be comfortable in making their own choices, making mistakes, learning from those mistakes, not feeling under pressure from other people. And we will create that environment for them. So you, you have a very clear understanding about why it's not a good idea. The coaches then aren't yelling multiple instructions throughout a game. And you have a very different watching experience. But we also know from the world of sport, don't we, that if we were at, um, you know, let's say the Wimbledon tennis final, nobody starts shouting out when they're about to serve for match point. 
nobody stood at the US Masters over that final putt, putt to win the tournament and people are shouting from the galleries. I know it gets a bit scary on the Ryder Cup day, but that's a bit different. But generally, as a rule, that's because people have got used to what that environment looks like and what that environment entails. So if anybody joins that environment, it's like, oh, this is what we do here. This is what it looks like. I will conform and join in. The problem we've got at the moment is we've got so many inconsistencies in it that, that it becomes really difficult because you don't quite know who to follow and who to who to lead. So this is why I was saying it's going to take a huge effort, you know, across all stakeholders to to try and improve the environments around young people's sport. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. I, I totally agree with that. Uh, kind of shifting veins a little bit, you know, so many coaches at some point, uh, they end up coaching their own child. I would love to hear your perspective on that. How can coaches who coach their own kid uh, make it a great experience for their kid and themselves? Yeah, I mean, look, this is our uh, best-selling book on Amazon. We did a lot of work on this. It's it's called Two Hats. Um, uh, you can get it on Amazon. And we managed to get, you know, Harry Redknapp, the former Tottenham Hotspur manager, wrote the foreword. And um, we got loads of leading sports figures from uh, across, the, across the world to contribute to that. People who've taken on that role. Um, look, I think it's uh, an amazing role. Uh, I think there's so many positives um, attached to it, but I think you've got to be aware um, of what you're taking on. Um, coaching can be tough. Um, it can certainly change the dynamic of things going on at home, both for you and your kid and for you and your uh, partner or whoever that may be who's living with you. Um, so I think, you know, before you take it on, you, you, you've got to have those conversations around, is this going to work? You know, can we commit the time? Are we aware that I'm probably going to be on devices a little bit more because I've got more people to organize? Am I going to, you know, I'm going to be away more at the weekends because I've got to take my team and all those things. I think it's really important to have those chats, including having a chat with our kids first. I think we have to have that dialogue with them to say, how do you feel about me coaching you? And actually, most young kids think it's really cool that, that mum or dad are going to go and do it. But actually, as they get a little bit older, they may not quite share the same enthusiasm. So I think, you know, again, that goes back to that sort of regular dialogue. Um, I think you've then got to have a chat with other siblings who are maybe at home. Uh, just to check they're happy because you may have other kids involved in other sports or other programs. And I think you've got to see how they feel. And I think once you've done a bit around that, you can look at the role itself. Um, and then it's all about those boundaries. When does the parent hat go on? When does the coaching hat go on? But you need to paint the picture for your kid. What does it look like when mum or dad have the coaching hat on? What are you expecting to see from them? Because some of the things you'll expect to see from them may be very different from the expectations you have at home. But also those children who often have to arrive first, leave last at those venues while mum or dad do the coaching can often um, either be uh, left a little bit more than they should be. But also they, they lots of parent coaches say they really struggle with not showing favoritism towards their own kids. And as a result of that, they end up being overly critical and negative the other way, which rather defeats the, the reason that they got into it in the first place. So I think there's lots of dialogue that we need to have around boundaries about this is what it's going to look like when I'm coach. But actually, do you know what? kid the moment that we get back in the car and that car door shuts the coach hat comes off the parent hat goes on and you've got to revert back to being mum and dad I think the, the the negative aspects of this is when it just carries over from the field and continues for the whole week at home and everything's linked to the sporting experience so I think I think that's my Certainly the biggest finding that we found about the handling of those those boundaries and being aware, I guess, of the, the positive discrimination bit where we overly discriminate on our own kid and are particularly harsh on them and 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 maybe lose sight of why we did it in the first place is a is a big challenge. Yeah. And yeah, it 
I, I have not, I have a two year old son, so I have not coached him in anything, uh, yet, but, uh, the coach that I assist with, one of the coaches I assist with, he, he just coached his son in the basketball season that we had. And it, it was challenging for him at times. And, and like you said, it, uh, yeah, hard to not be one way or the other in terms of favoritism. Either I'm showing favoritism or I'm being being overly critical to, to walk that middle line. I think most coaches would probably agree that that's hard with your with your own kid. I mean, co coaches, co coaches are good there, Luke, and that you know that's one of the things we suggest in the book. You know, if you've got somebody helping you with the coaching. You can maybe say to them, can you just look at my kid in a totally different light to what I'm doing? So they can drop in the praise and the feedback. They can do those bits, which isn't quite as obvious to the rest of the group because coaches don't want to be seen to be being, you know, favoritist towards their own kids because they then run the risk of upsetting the rest of the parents that are watching as well. So it's a very difficult line to tread. It's a brilliant role, but the, you've, you've got to be aware of some of the complexities of it. Yeah. And that's one of the things we did. And I kind of said to the head coach in the beginning, I said, Hey, if you ever need me to, to, you know, give Alex the feedback that he needs, like, just give me a look and I'll know. And that way you guys can kind of, yeah, maintain a, a healthier yeah. relationship because that, you know, their relationship doesn't stop when practice ends and it doesn't stop when the season ends, right? They're, they're still together all the time. So a- another thing I'd love to pick your brain on, and, and you mentioned it in that last section, was the car ride home. And so it gets talked about quite, quite often. And, and this is not just for coaches who are coaching their kid, but just for parents in general, how can we do a, a better job um, creating healthy, <laughs> a healthy sporting experience for our kids? And, and what do we need to do differently on those car rides to and from training and games? Yeah, look, I think, I think if you take a a step back from the car journey home and you look at it logically, you know, our kids have gone off to perform. They are naturally nervous, whatever they've been doing. They are out there in the big world. They're desperate to please mum and dad. They're desperate to please the coaches on the whole when they go and play their sport or they go to training. We then take on the the lead of, I guess, as a chief cheerleader, And we feel every emotion when we watch our kids train and play. So we enjoy it when it's going well. We feel sick when it's not going so well for them or we see them sad and disappointed. We live every moment with them, which is emotionally draining as they're going through the experience. So we get to the end of training or the end of matches and our children are desperate to get out of the big world and go back to being children. Uh, They're desperate for us to be mum and dad. We're tired and emotional. They're tired and emotional, and we end up thinking that this is a really good time to have a debrief and have a productive conversation. And that in itself, it you know, can cause a problem before we even get to the car. Um, we've done lots of work and dialogue on this and tried a number of different things. You know, I think after a game, we have got to try and find a way of greeting our kids with something consistent and something that's positive, whether it's been the best game in the world or whether it's been the worst, because I think that initial contact tells them that, okay, it's back to being, you know, mum and dad, and and we're going to have the dialogue from there. I think in an ideal world in the car journey home, it'd be amazing if our kids led the conversation. Now, the problem you've got there is some kids would never speak, which is fine as well. But we don't like that as parents because the car time can be a really quality time for us to catch up with our kids. So I think if we're going to ask questions to them after their sport, we need to ask them questions that allow them to reflect on the experience. You know, with teenage kids in particular or older children, now if we ask them questions that are really closed and they can get away with giving us a yes or no, or in a lot of cases, just a grunt, then children are going to take that. So, you know, as parents, we need to be asking them things, you know, what was the best bit for you today? Who was your best teammate? What did you find the most challenging? What might you do differently next week? Um, What was the highlight of the day for you? Questions that get them to share with us how they are feeling because ultimately it's their sporting journey and it's not for us to enforce all of our views and opinions onto them so actually being able to listen to that and steer dialogue from there is really important but the other thing that I think we've got to get really comfortable with is 
there's nothing wrong with silence. There's nothing wrong with our kids being upset and sad when things have gone wrong. It is a healthy part of children growing up. And, 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 and we really struggle with that as parents, and I, I get it, and I do get it, and I struggle with it as well, is that in trying to fill that silence and immediately make the world a better place, that's when we start looking to blame officials, coaches, other teammates, anybody we can possibly think, oh, we'll pull into the nearest McDonald's as well because that's going to make it all go away and feel better, when actually silence is all right. They're allowed to go through that. And kids bounce back far quicker than adults do. You know, 20 minutes later, they'll be thinking, OK, what am I putting on my pizza tonight? And we're still stewing on it four days later. And we've got to get comfortable with that because every parent I meet says I would like a really resilient kid. Well, you can't have resilient kids if you're making excuses for them every time it goes wrong. You can't have resilient kids if you reward them when it's gone wrong and find a way of making the world feel better. Because actually, when they go through those processes, that's when they develop that resilience. That's when, when they are ready to talk again, they'll start to talk to us. And then we can start picking up the dialogue about, right, how do we move on from this? And we talk about what went on, what could we do differently, ways to approach it. And that builds up that history that we have in time when we get to car journeys further down the line, where we can draw on those experiences together rather than you know, rather than it just being our quick fix win by, you know, blame, excuse, reward, any of those things that we know don't have a long lasting impact on people. Yeah. So many good things in there. One, the questions that you mentioned, so good for parents and coaches to ask kids to get them to think and reflect. And two, what you're talking about there at the end is so important for coaches and, and parents, obviously, to, to help kids and allow kids to navigate the emotions that they will inevitably feel in the sporting experience. It is such an emotional experience in so many ways for coaches, for parents, for kids, like you talked about. And I think one of the things that coaches struggle with, and, and like you said, parents do, is letting kids feel you've got to let them feel what they're feeling. You got to validate their feelings because they're, they're often legitimate, totally legitimate. Yeah. And when, when we don't, I was actually just listening to a Brene Brown podcast and it was all, all talking just about emotion and, and healthy emotional development. We stunt their emotional intelligence and their emotional growth. When we just try to fix it for them, when we say, Oh, it's really hard. You're sad. Let's go. Like you said, let's go to McDonald's to make it feel better. Or let's, let's blame others. We don't actually allow them to. Yeah. Feel the realities of life. And, and from there, learn how to feel something that's really hard and still move forward from it. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think that's so, so, so powerful. So critical. I, I've got a, a few rapid fire questions for you before we, before we hop off. And, and I would love for you to just kind of answer the first things that come to your mind, mainly from your coaching experience. So, I mean, you said you, you spent 20 plus years coaching and, and teaching. Uh, so I've got a handful of them. Just tell me the first things that come to your mind. Here's the first one. Uh, describe the best coach that you played with, or sorry, that you played for or that you coached with in three words. Uh, passionate, enthusiastic, caring. It's hmm. really good. The next one, the most fun part of coaching is? Uh, seeing children do something that a few months earlier they were incapable of doing. I love it. I wish I would have known blank before my first coaching experience. Uh, I wish I would have known um that it wasn't all about me and that I didn't need to be as much of a dictator as I was when I first started coaching. That's powerful. I know I'm successful as a coach when blank. When children are still involved in sport into their adult years and talk fondly about that time that, that I, they were part of the sessions that I ran. That's awesome such a focus on the long-term. 
Uh, last one, uh, and and this might get a little bit longer, uh, but first things that come to your mind, what do you think are the top three things that every coach in every sport at every level, they need to be educated on these things? Um, communication, building relationships, and creating positive environments. That's really good. Will you say more about creating positive environments? Yeah. I, th- I think people who, who have them will know what I mean. It's just that amazing mix where everybody's working together. Everybody is valued. The conversations are really good. They don't always have to be positive. Sometimes they can be really challenging, but people are able to respect each other's views, respect how they work together, work towards a common goal, um, buy into the process, um, but, but, but also on a far wider level than just the sport itself, that actually people feel connected to an environment and, and want to be part of it. And it's, it's, I guess it's one of those things that's really hard to, to explain in words. I think it's more of a feeling thing when you're involved in them or you know that you're witnessing them. Um, I think it's really powerful. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. Uh, special environments, they're, they're contagious. You know it when you're in it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and, and I would totally agree. The more, the more coaches can put effort and thought and intention into creating that kind of environment, the better it will be. And I think, like you said, the more often we'll have players that are still involved in sport into their adult years. And they tell us later on how much they enjoy being coached by us because of that special environment that hopefully we're creating. Well, Gordon, this has been awesome. Uh, Before we hop off, why don't you share with coaches where they can contact you, connect with you and, and get the things that you offer. Yeah, so uh, please check us out. It'd be great to see you at www.parentsinsport.co.uk. We're also on social media. We're on Twitter at WWPIS and Facebook at WWPIS. There's loads of content on there. There's regular podcasts, there's videos, there's learning courses. Uh, We share our experiences of working across lots of different sports, all the way from grassroots programs through to Olympic pathway programs. And we do it through working with parents. We do it through working with coaches as part of coach education and we do it through working with organizations in all working together uh, to create the best possible experiences for for young people so it'd be great to hear from some of your listeners awesome gordon thank you this has been fantastic and really appreciate you joining me yeah no problem at all coaches thanks for listening to this episode and thanks again to gordon for coming on to the podcast If you'd like to get a free copy of the notes from today's conversation, go to transformsport.org slash podnotes or click the link in the show details. If you'd like to learn more about the upcoming Coaches Club cohort, you can click the link in the show details or if you want to schedule a call to reserve your spot, you can also click that link in the show details. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please take a minute to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts and give us a shout out on Twitter at coachesclub underscore. Thanks for listening to the Coaches Club podcast powered by Transform Sport, where we believe great coaches transform lives, athletes deserve great coaches, and coaches deserve great training. 